Now let's get to the analysis of what happened and why it happened on Saturday. Our beginning the analysis, we go back to the uh, small history about national chairman. We'll begin with national chairman. We'll do general secretary. We'll go to analyze the results, and then we, we will do, uh, we go to take the results, and then we'll analyze it and find out why what happened happened. So join us right now. Uh, this is Good Evening Ghana. Okay, so what are the, the former national chairmen? So we begin with BJ Darocha. We showed you that already. Uh, so the, Darocha was the first chairman. Uh, let's move on to the next one. That's Peter Ala Ajete uh, was next after BJ Darocha. And then he went to Ni Samuel Odoi Sykes. He was the next chairman. After Odoi Sykes was uh, uh, Nei Haruna Iseku. Uh, he was the next chairman during the Kufour era, as when Kufour was president. Peter McMenu, formerly Western Regional Chairman, now became the national chairman of the party into the 2008 elections that was lost by the MPP. And then after McMenu came the famous Jacob Echebi Lamte, and uh, Jake was chairman in the period of 2012 elections. That election was also lost. And then comes in uh, by Paul Afoko, who was elected for the 2016 election. Somehow all the difficulties occurred. He was suspended as national chairman. And then came an acting chairman, Freddie Blay, who later in 2018, uh, secured his own victory in Koforidia and became the chairman. So as of Saturday, Freddie was the chairman. The election was conducted, and the landslide winner is the new chairman, uh, Stephen in team, uh, who now is the new chairman. Um, okay, so now the new national chairman is Stephen in team. Congratulations to Stephen in team, and we're going to be doing the analysis on uh, how in team became after five attempts spanning a period of two decades. How did in team become the chairman? Okay, let's go to the general secretary uh, and look at it. Okay, so the general secretary, we run through it very quickly. Um, we begin with uh, Ajenim Boatin, Joseph Ajenim Boatin. We still don't have his photograph. Uh, his son is in parliament. Uh, maybe we should get him to give us his father's photograph. Okay, and then there's Daniel Boche, the uh, eternal general secretary of the New Patriotic Party. Uh, Nano Hinin To also became general secretary of the party during the Kufour era. And then, of course, the indefatigable, immortal Kujo Usufri Sejon uh, was also a member of the general secretary. Kwabena Japan changed a lot. Uh, the general secretaryship in terms of how elections are conducted in the party. And uh, now John Buedu became general secretary. He was general secretary on Saturday. He was trying to become general secretary again. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was unfortunate. He was defeated. And so now the MPP has a new general secretary in the person of Justin Frimpong Kodia, JFK, they call him. Uh, that's the story now. Let's get straight on to the results and see what happened with the results. Quickly, uh, we move to the chairmanship results. So this is how the chairmanship ended. I'm sure you all know that by now. Stephen Ayesu in team came up with 4,014 votes, representing 72.8% of the votes. George Kwabena Abankwa Yeboa, uh, who used to be the national treasurer, came up with uh, uh, 294 votes, 5.3% of the votes. Stephen Asamoah Boate was the closest contender to Stephen in team. He was able to garner 1,010 votes, representing 18% of the votes. Gifty Asantewa Aye, a.k.a. Daviyama, uh, just managed 44%. And uh, 44 votes, representing 0.8%. Sami Crab, my good friend, uh, came up with 32 votes, representing 0.6%. Professor Christopher Ameyayo Kunfi had a poor showing. A lot was suspected from Ameyayo Kunfi, and in fact, at some point, he was being talked of as talked about as the one to un unseat Stephen in team. Uh, Professor Ameyayo Kunfi's uh, performance was quite abysmal, isn't it? Given the stature of, of, of the, his stature in the party and all that, Professor Ameyayo Kunfi only managed 101 um, votes, uh, totaling 1.8%. Akwesi Oseji, a former foreign minister, a deputy foreign minister, later foreign minister, uh, ended up with 20 votes with 0.4%. So this is how the Stephen in team conversation ended. Now let's talk about the details here in terms of the analysis. So who was Stephen in team? Now Stephen in team, you remember, is a party faithful. He's a real party faithful. And he had come from the Kufo era. And he had always been thought about as a candidate uh, from the Kofor side who wanted to be chairman. He tried and tried and tried and tried, and it didn't work. Uh, his closest uh, shot at the chairmanship came, I think, in two elections. The one was in Koforidua in 2018 against Freddie Blay, and the other one, I believe, was against uh, uh, Peter McMenu, I think. Uh, that one, both elections were quite close, and team still didn't win. Uh, however, he had had excellent relations with the, 
the government of the MPP since 2017. President Akufuado nominated him and later appointed him as the chairman of the National Lands Commission. That's a very sensitive appointment uh, to give to a person. So, Stephen, in team, you will consider a big part of the, of the inner circle of, uh, of Akufuado's team. And, uh, and then in 2020, when President won the elections again, he, of course, nominated or re-nominated Stephen Intim to be the chairman of the Lands Commission. Stephen Intim is a man of diverse background and uh, multidisciplinary background. He is a businessman in the main, but he's essentially a politician. He's a very, very thick and deep politician. He's, he breathes politics. He eats politics. Uh, somehow, he's never been minister. I'm not sure whether he doesn't like that. But you know, like Canada, Japan, a lot of businessmen don't want to be minister of anything. They just want to do their business and, and do their politics. I, I see in team as one of those. He doesn't like minister. Uh, he just wants to do his politics. So uh, that's, that's uh, Stephen in team. I saw him uh, Thursday before the election, wasn't it? Was it Tuesday? I think Tuesday before the election, I saw him somewhere in Laboni. And he was in very high spirit. And, uh, and uh, it, look, it looked obvious that Stephen Intim was going to win the election. But what does Stephen Intim now bring to the ticket in terms of all the sensitive conversations that's going on about the government? As party chairman, he's going to sit in cabinet and he's going to relay to the cabinet, the set of president, vice president and his ministers, he's going to relay to them the position of the party on some of the things that they'll be discussing. Now, the position of the party is going to be purely based on what should be done to make 2024's victory for MPP easier, or what should be done to make the victory happen, and what should not be done. That's even more important, because if you're a ruling party, the optics are very, very significant. The optics of how you govern, not even so much what you do or don't do, but the optics, how it looks like. Does this look wrong to people? If it looks wrong, then you don't have to do it. Does this look right to people? If it looks right, you, you have to do it. So Stephen and team and the general secretary who will be attending the cabinet are going to be relaying this uh, to the cabinet. That's the, going to be a tussle. And, uh, and he will have to need, he will need a lot of grace and articulation to be able to convince uh, the, the, the key executive actors that this has to be done, this should not be done. For instance, everyone is talking about a cabinet reshuffle. So for the party people, they're going to look at that and say, go to cabinet and tell the president that from the party position, we think that in terms of changing the optics about, about the government and the party, you need to do a cabinet reshuffle right now. The president may say that, well, I want to give it three months. I'm working with IMF, and after that, I'll do it. And, and that kind of becomes a conversation. So that's really going to be their role. They're also going to look for funding for the next election because they have two key things to do. They now have to do the parliamentary elections, where in, in 137 uh, constituencies that the MPP has, almost all of them are going to be challenged. So they're going to have 137 crucial elections with incumbents, and then they have something they call uh, orphan seats. And then they're going to have another 137 seats uh, where the MPP does not have the seat. In some areas, 19 of those the president did win the election, uh, they're going to have to, to, to work on that. So in selecting parliamentary candidates, Stephen Intim is going to be very useful as a chairman together with the general secretary because this 2024 election, a lot is going to hinge on parliament. The NDC's confidence and excitement is how well they did in the 2020 election, closing the parliamentary gap. Now, a lot of the conversation about how people lose parliamentary elections has to do with the candidate that was chosen, not so much that, but actually the candidate that was disqualified. All of these undertones in 275 constituencies, Stephen and Tim is going to be in a cry and would have to legislate on some of these things that we need the candidate who can win. So this candidate must step aside. This must be done. That must be done. Of course, the case of Formena clearly showed that the central party was not sensitive to the issues in Formena, and that's a matter we can talk about. So all of that is going to be the work Stephen and Tim will do. Can he do it? Certainly he has the gravitas for it. He does. Certainly he has the experience for it. He does. And certainly he has the friends who can advise him on what to do. He's still very close to J.A. Kofor, who sits in Peduasi these days. People go to him for advice. J.A. Kofor has tons of it. So J.A. Kofor is still available to help Stephen in team. Other chairman, Peter McMenu, is still available to sort of uh, help him. And uh, all the others are still there to help him. What does Stephen in team represent? Does he represent a change or does he represent a continuation? That's also another interesting analysis. Because if you were talking about in team... Uh, three election ten years ago, you will clearly say that Intim is here and the Akufado government is here. Opposite. 
But since 2017, can we really say that? And I, I'm not sure what the answer to this question is, but I'm just throwing it to you to look at. Can we really say that Intim is an establishment candidate for the purpose of last Saturday's election, or is not an establishment candidate? Does it represent change or continuation? Send your text message on what you think about Stephen Intim as we move to analyze the general secretary uh, position. And uh, before we analyze the general secretary position, uh, let me just show you the results, and I'll go to some videos uh, that you have to see. So John Boydou came up with 2,524 votes, representing 45.6% of the total votes. And Justin Kodia came up with 2,837 votes, representing 51.2% of the votes. He drew to Musa Superior, my good friend. I think he did a yeoman's job. He picked up as much as 104, 1.9% superior, better luck next time. And then Ramseya Ajiman Prempe got eight. Frederick Oparian Sanded at Bismarck. He has a bigger image than just picking up 50 votes out of a potential 6,000. And uh, he got 0.9%. And Charles Bissu, who pulled out, got 12%. And Charles Bissu is a very articulate young man. Before we go to the analysis of the general secretary, here is Kennedy in Japan. We're going to show you a few of Kennedy Japan's videos. Here is Kennedy in Japan ranting and raving and smashing a table in a studio claiming that there's absolutely no way John Boedu was going to win the election. This was about two months ago. Have a look. John Boedu will lose this election. I will punish you for that. What will you come for? But you see what will happen to John Boedu. I swear to God. Every executive, because there's, when you go to party headquarters, there's nobody there. Gassus will listen to me. There's nobody at party headquarters to listen to their grievances. John Boedu will lose this election. I will punish you for that. What from the chrome for you? But you see what will happen to John Wood. I swear to God. Every executive, because there's when you go to party headquarters, there's nobody there. Gasus will listen to me. There's nobody at party headquarters to listen to their grievances. So that was uh, Kennedy Japan a few months ago, angrily predicting that John Boydou, the general secretary of the party, was not available to party faithfuls and therefore that he was not going to win. But nonetheless, John Boydou gathered a lot of support. He did. He managed to gather a lot of support. He got the establishment behind him. He got key people behind him. And he went on the ground. This is what a lady was performing for John Boydou on Saturday morning at the Accra Sports Stadium. Have a look. All right, you saw that. So, so, so then you know that, yeah, John Boydou had support, didn't he? Okay, something significant happened that everyone is talking about. Uh, I don't know whether it's my friend Chairman Wu to me who was able to put the 16 regional chairmen together. Tonight we are hearing that it's not 16, it's 15 because Chairman Kutin of Central Region was not part of it. But they put 16 regional chairmen together, all 15, and then they went ahead and pledged support for John Boydou. Something that was suicidal, but it was done. Here is the video. The Akan United said, I yell regional chairman for a year sixteen. Now, young in Ayasia, you see, I know that's a chairman who to me, men are mean lady, uh, chairman for no. And to say, see, I know a move fifteen. And the general says, see, I know they move fifteen. No, uh, number one, sire, yet they are saying the child, yes, no, number one, sire, I know. That's the set. Yadi now when you vote as no any MPP for no one in Anwen Munyam, you have got to abandon and continue as a general secretary. 
Where they are the frontier? Where they are? Now, Okwa, General Secretary John Bodu, order number one. It would do her. Okwa, yes, Ruho. Okwa, yes, Ruho. Joan, let down Okwa, yes, Ruho. Okwa, yes, Ruho. Okwa, yes, Ruho. JB, no, down Okwa, yes, Okay, but what I liked about you, so you saw the original chairman predicting now uh, some people, and you hear an interview, Kennedy Japan, we'll play that later on, where he's asking the original chairman to actually resign from their positions uh, for taking that stand, uh, allowing themselves to be whipped, and then uh, come before camera and pledge their support for John Boydou, who unfortunately did not win. A very good man, uh, John Boydou, but he did not win. But I always talk about the other side. You know, I talk about... Um, the battle is intellectual and the advantage is spiritual. It's always important as a nation, and that's why we talk about cathedral and all that, as a nation, as a company, as an individual, never ever ignore the spiritual. And you have to make obeisance to the spiritual, make obeisance to the resurrected Lord, the Lord Jesus. That's where the power is. But you have to just understand it. Have a look at this video. I wasn't surprised at all when I saw this video with my friend Reverend Kusi Boatin, he was here in the studio the other day to talk to us about the cathedral. See what Kusi Boatin was doing. Have a look. I declare that even as you go and this oil shows that is placed on your head, the difference will be made to an extent that men that were even angry at you when they look at you, do have no option than to vote for you. May angels be your your security and may angels be your promoter may angels be those that shall prevent any form of pilfering and any form of negativities anyone that shall be assigned by the enemy to do evil let the holy ghost strike them the in the name Jesus. of yeshua you are going and not coming back with nothing short of victory God for God your God victory God. has already been declared and it shall be seen it shall be seen by the world. And when he begins a thing, he also finishes it. Your protection is paramount. Your protection cannot be compromised. You are covered in the name of Jesus. Go in peace and come with testimonies of his grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's it. You saw Reverend Kusibuatin anointing the man and saying, and all of that is scriptural, that people who don't like you would even vote for you. And that happens. It's, it's, a, it's a part of the blessings of Abraham, that the people who don't like him will like him. And God says that the people who don't like you, they will be my enemies, and your friends will be my friends. It happens. And so in life's endeavor, spirituality is very, very important. Let's get back to the touch screen now. So, uh, why did John Buidu lose? Is that a question we should be asking? Or why did Justin Kodia win? Which is which? Why did John Buidu lose? Or why did Justin Kodia win? Now, in this case, would you say that John Buidu lost it or Kodia won it? I think John Buidu lost it, but I'm, I'm, I may be wrong. But I think John Buidu lost it. Why did I say John Buidu lost it? Because everything was working for him until uh, uh, Kodia's campaign, which has started underground. So when we did some inquiries about, uh, about Kodia and his formidability for the process on Saturday, uh, somebody, a key MPP voice, told me that, you see, you shouldn't write Kodia off. And I said, why? He said he had been working with the uh, Youth Employment Agency as his chief executive. And in terms of Youth Employment Agency, uh, you deal with the youth. And what he had managed to do as the chief executive of the Youth Employment Agency was to ensure that police station executives, constituency executives who were qualified, were recruited onto the various programs of the Youth Employment Agency. And I said, wow. He said, yes. So you can't ignore him because he's carrying an army of youth with him, people that he has given livelihood to, people that he has worked with. And as you've heard the testimony, he's a very handsome uh, hands-on kind of guy. So he goes into the nooks and crannies. He's working with the Zoom Lion people. He's pushing and that's the kind of person that he sold himself to be. So this person was telling me that in terms of grassroots voting, he thinks that Kodia is going to get uh, a lot of votes there and it could be very dicey uh, for the Buedu situation. And I asked him, what about the establishment pushing the John Buedu agenda? He said, that's not going to work because the people on the grassroots, they love the establishment candidates. They voted for Chemaun to me in Kumase, but they did not follow Chemaun to me's advice to vote for John Buedu. They did not. Ashanti came heavy in favor of Kodia, if you look at the analysis. But these are the same delegates who voted for Chemaun to me, 
just a month ago, and, and they gave Chairman Wu to me a landslide in the Kumasi election for regional chairman. But when it came to this one, and Chairman Wu to me was pointing them to vote for John Bodu. They said, sorry, sir, we love you, but we will vote for Kodia. So that's really what happens. It's not that they don't like the establishment people. They like them, but they have a reason for voting. So perhaps establishments should look in some better detail about what is happening on the ground or what is more likely to happen on the ground. Or when establishment finds what the ground is thinking, establishment should not try and change it. They should just leave it. Let me say that again. Whenever the establishment finds what the ground is thinking, they should not try to change it. They should just leave it. Because if you try to change it, you come against a whirlwind and you come against the, 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 the behemoth. Of, of the might of the people at the base, usually, usually you will not win against that. It, it's a strong wind that is blowing. So maybe, just maybe, that's what happened. There was a lot of uh, influence brought onto bear. But the, the reason why establishment did that is something you can understand, can't you? So they are saying that we're going into an election. Our chairman is not running. Um, and so we have a new chairman. Should we have a new chairman and a new general secretary? Two important positions at the party office at the national level. Do we have a new chairman and a new general secretary? So the established people who were supporting John Budu were concerned that, and that's what Wuntumi told me here uh, last week, isn't it? They were concerned that if you go and have this kind of situation where everybody is new, you may have problems. And they cite 2008, where the chairman, Mark Menu, was new, general secretary, Oinito was new. They went into the election and then they, they were defeated. Okay, so that's, that's the point they were making, but it wasn't to be. I think that one of the reasons why John Buedu lost, and that happened towards the end of the campaign, and when somebody asked me those days, I said that if the elections are held early now, John Buedu might win, but as time wears on, Something is working on the minds of the delegates. What's working on the minds of the delegates? They're asking questions about the occurrences at the parliamentary election in the 2020 election. Because delegates are very concerned about that, and the party people are concerned about that. that ah, how did we lose so many parliamentary seats in the 2020 election, especially in those 19 other seats that our MPs were losing, but the president was winning? It means that our party is a good party as far as the ground is concerned, but the candidate, now what happens in the selection of these candidates? And then they heap the blame on Freddie Blay and John Boydou. And as the campaign was going on, it was a very difficult question for John Boydou's campaign to answer. And they were telling him that Freddie Blay is gone. Samia Uku, who was national organizer, is gone. So what are you doing there? Because you guys occasioned this defeat. And they are gone. They've taken responsibility for it. They bowed out for other people to come. Why are you still there? That was a very difficult question for John Boydou's campaign to answer. And that's the point about campaigns. You see, if the campaign swings in a certain way, and a certain question comes up, and you cannot answer that question, then your campaign is collapsing. And I think that's what happened to John Boydou, because he was leading. He, was, he had a commanding lead. He was really going to win this thing. But as the question keeps coming, what are you going to do to show that you, it is different from 2020? What are you going to do? You had the opportunity in 2020. We had such a big parliamentary lead from 2016. It whittled down almost for us to be in minority. That's what MP people were saying. They're asking John Poydou that, what happened? What is happening? What, what went on? Your party chairman says, I'm not running anymore because he's conceded and accepted responsibility. National organizer, Samia Oku says, I'm not doing it anymore. General Secretary, join them. Let's have a new team. I think that was powerful. And that's how come that uh, Justin Kodia came through uh, very easily. And there's people who were talking about Justin Kodia's age. At, at some point, they said that he's, he's too young. He's only 40. And then I think Kodia's campaign came back with the age of Damboche. At the time, he became General Secretary and won an election against NDC that had Rawlings in it. And then that sort of settled it. You see, so that's the point I'm making. The issue came up. Oh, that Kodia is a small boy. Is that he going to do General Secretary of a big party like that? And then they told them to go and check how old Damboche was in 1997. Go and check. How old Damboche was when he wrote a campaign against J.J. Rawlins and, and then the, and the might of the National Democratic Congress in the year 2000. Go and check. And they went to check and they saw that Damboche's age was very, very similar, close to Kodia's age. And then that argument uh, was whittled away, deconstructed completely. And so Kodia continued to ride on and he rode on with the innocence, with what he had done at YEA, with the fact that he wants to deliver it, he's hungrier for it, and all sorts of campaign gimmicks were done, and eventually uh, Kodia won. So I think that uh, John Boydou lost 
uh, the matter because he couldn't answer that question of history. Therefore, now going into the next phase of the process, politicians must learn that history is very important. If you have not been able to achieve something, given the opportunity, you cannot ask delegates to let you achieve it. The question about money is also important, but clearly, at the end of the Congress, we have seen that, everybody has seen that uh, money is important, but it does not always win. In fact, it showed clearly, as Amar Bhattin was complaining about something about money, um, and then eventually when the results came out, uh, Stephen in team's wide victory could not have been about money, and Justin Kodia's victory could not have been about money, because perhaps other people had more money than they did. So, yeah, so money is not the key uh, factor, is it? It is how delegates view people. Okay, before I go to the next line of the conversation, which is, which presidential candidates will be happier with these results? Will they all be happy or some will be happier than others? Let's get back and listen to Kennedy Japan again. After results had been declared, what he told delegates at the stadium, including asking regional chairman to resign. Have a look at the video. My people, I told them that if you starve the grassroots and you come to them last minute, they'll vote against you. No authority. And I say, I've said it several times, no authority will change the grassroots because you didn't know them. And when you want power, you know them. They will vote against you. And the signal is clear to every senior member of this party not to come openly and raise hands. The 15 chairman and the central regional chairman, all the 16 chairmen, they should be ashamed of themselves because they couldn't decide for the party. All right, welcome back, and uh, we do congratulate all other winners. Nana B, my good friend, welcome to the national organizer position. Aziz, uh, you couldn't make it for our interview. We interviewed a while here last Thursday, but Aziz made it again as a Nasara coordinator. Kate Jemfua, uh, the Lord has spoken for you. So what a mighty win that you got. Okay, now I was asking the question, which I'm going to postpone for the conversation on Tuesday, maybe, uh, Thursday or Tuesday. Who is happier, who would be, who should be, who ought to be happier with the results on Saturday? Is it Dr. Muhammad Baumia who should be excited about the results on Saturday? Does it portend anything good for him? Is it him? Or is it Alan Chemate who should be happy with what had happened on, on Saturday? Uh, does, is it him who should say, oh, the results portends good things for me? Or is Dr. Baumia who should say it? Of course, there are other contestants, Kwabene Japan, Joe Gatte, Adai Nimo, and Kennedy at Japan have all indicated that they will contest. I'll leave it here because tonight is about last Saturday. Next week, we'll come and discuss who is happier with the events uh, over there. Now, though... <laughs>